Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, it's really exciting to see so many smiling faces here. Um, thank you, Kira, for having me here. I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. I'm gonna talk about uh, my process creatively, but then I'm also gonna talk about um, the specific narrative of how uh, this all happened and what this all means. Because I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of layers to it. And that's one of the things I like about this work is that there's a lot of layers, but I think it might be a little challenging to understand all of them. So that's kind of why I'm doing this, letting people know what it all means. Um, so uh, I know there's a lot of creative people in the audience, so I know that you're used to this concept of um, generating a bunch of ideas just creatively and not censoring yourself and just kind of throwing a lot of ideas out and letting them accumulate. And that, you know, that being one part of the process is the production of just ideas. And then kind of going back later and saying, oh, what's good and what's not good? And then being the editorial part of the process and kind of picking through. And uh, I think of that like, I, I, I did a lot of poetry in college. So I think about with a poem, you just kind of start writing all of these lines and then you go back and take those lines and see which ones fit together. And you make a little machine that is, how do I take an idea that's in my head, create this little machine that can then go out into the world and try and create that same idea in other people's heads. So that's, that's how I think of the artwork, is this using this as a mechanism for taking the, these ideas and encapsulating them and putting them out into the world. But with that goes this idea of intent, because I now have this intention of this, whatever this thought is in my head, and I want to create that intention in somebody else's mind. So I think I'm going to put a little pin in this idea of intent, because I think that becomes really important in an overview of the work. So I got the show based on a piece that's in the back, and it's a, an American flag called Tattered Glory. So it's an American flag made out of uh, gunpowder. I have a gunpowder printing press. So I carve um, symbols into a sheet of wood. I pack that sheet of wood with gunpowder and then I take a canvas and I press it down into that and I detonate the gunpowder into the canvas to create these images. That particular piece is done using AR-15 gunpowder. So it's assault rifle gunpowder to create this image of an American flag. So when we, we think about intent, right, I've got a very specific intent that I'm doing when I'm making an American flag out of assault rifle gunpowder. I took that images of that piece and I put them on my Instagram and I got a bunch of followers who were gun shop owners who thought that an American flag made out of assault rifle gunpowder was an amazing representation of the America they loved. Intent. It's a very, it's a very different intent. To someone having that reaction that's different than mine, a very simple response is to respond that um, you're wrong and I'm right, and that you're you're not you're not getting it. Well, there's a lot of ego in that, and so. Instead of that, I kind of sat with it, and there's a lot of complexity, and it's a lot of uncomfortableness. So I would say intent is one thing I'm gonna put a pin in. The other one's gonna be an uncomfortableness. I think uncomfortableness and intent are kind of the two main concepts in this whole project. So we've got this gunpowder flag that I'm saying something about gun violence with, and people are interpreting as uh, a great thing to be proud of America about. And so I had to sit with that. And rather than tell them they're wrong, I had to say, okay, well, who are these people? And are they wrong to love America for this reason? Like, I love America. I think it's got some problems, but I can hang on to the complexity that it's got problems and that it does great things. And some of those problems are maybe different than what they think the problems are, and we're kind of at odds with that. Well, out of that came this piece because um, it's, a, it's a mirror. It's, a, it, it's an American flag that becomes a, a reflection of the people who are looking in it. So those gun shop owners 
can love this symbol of America. I can love this symbol of America. But really, the symbol isn't anything other than us looking back into it. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, I want to make this really big. Number one, because I like making really big art. That's another ego thing. But making it really big symbolizes kind of the grandiosity of America. But something that occurred to me in, in, in thinking about it was it also created a divider. There was a Richard Serra piece that was, um, Richard Serra does large pieces of uh, steel artwork. And he did a piece that was a long arc of steel that went across a park. It's a massive, impressive, amazing piece. And the people who lived um, around there, worked around there, ended up having the city take it back out because it divided the park and people had to walk around it. And they hated that. That made them spend two more minutes to get to McDonald's. So they took it out. But it made me think of that division that a large piece of artwork can create. So the American flag representing something that we can all look at and see ourselves in and aspire to and be proud of, but also something that divides, that people could be on either side of. So the name of the piece is the United Divider. It's a uniter, brings people together, we see ourselves in it, but it's also a divider. So I started playing with this idea of this large um, mirrored American flag and um, I started thinking about what it is that really kind of um, pulls us apart in all of this and this kind of binary nature of the dialogue in the country. And it's, you know, I have my heroes and, you know, I will defend my heroes. I have my heroes who are over here and I'll defend them. And I might even overlook some of their flaws in order to defend them. And someone else might think that one of my heroes is really a villain. And I might think their heroes are villains. And I might see the bad parts of their heroes and not be able to see any of the good that they might have ever done. And I can only see the things that I think that this person did were good, but I can't see any of their flaws. And that kind of starts pushing this, it starts evacuating that center. That I think, from my standpoint, I think that that, that comes from things like our information systems as well. That we have to make these decisions quickly, we only read headlines. We don't have the time to settle in the uncomfortableness. Come back to uncomfortableness. The uncomfortableness of, oh, I might not understand exactly who this person is. Uh, they might have some good parts and bad parts to them. I want to have a decision now. I like this person or I hate this person. And that, you know, makes me, that soothes me to think that I've made a decision about them and now I can file them away. I don't have to think about them anymore. So, so that, that drove me to create this piece, United Divider. So I had, uh, the United Divider, and I'd, I'd photographed it, I'd taken it out to Burning Man, and took some pictures of it, and um, Kira selected me for this show, based on that gunpowder piece that I was showing in the show. And she came over to the studio, and we started talking about what we were going to do for a solo show. And I showed her a whole bunch of stuff, and I had a bunch of ideas, and I was excited about all these things, that was my first solo show. and. Uh, I showed her some of the prototypes I'd done of these mirrors, but at the time, I'd only been doing them just to make them really pretty. I hadn't been really thinking about them having any content, so I had been doing photographs of um, people in kind of like historic garb, because they look old, and so I was just making these little tests of them. And uh, I showed her a whole bunch of other work I was doing, and she said, after it was over, after the studio visit, she said, the best things you have going on here are this thing and those mirrors. Can you figure out a way to like do something with the mirrors and do something with this? And I was like, well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and I started thinking about it and I had known that what I wanted to do in the flag was I wanted the flag to be comprised of names of complex Americans. So in this, they're just lines. In the model, they're just lines. But those lines stand in for names. And the names that they stand in for are Americans who make you uncomfortable, who challenge that simple representation of, you know, hero and villain, um, that make it, some people that you might have already categorized as a hero or a villain, but by maybe exploring them a little deeper, you can find out they're a little of both, which actually means they're human, and that uh, they're <coughs> like us. So can you, can you hold the complexity of their humanity, and can you hold your own complexities of your humanity, and 
that again comes back to the reflection in the piece that it would be all these names. And I said, well, what I can do is I could do portraits of some of these complex Americans in the mirror process and then use that to then reflect back to what would be the, the fabric of the final piece. So the show's specifically about the United Divider. And the idea is that this would be one of maybe many shows moving forward of expressing other people who are part of that because this is a really wide spectrum of people that I chose for this show, but you could obviously choose specific segments of American history and do just people from that segment to explore um, that dynamic. Um, so a little about some of the people in the show. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, Martha Hughes Cannon because she's someone who, um, it's really easy based on which sentence you choose out of her biography to decide that she's a good guy or a bad guy, depending on who you are. Um, she's, she held four degrees by the time she was 24, and this is in the 1800s. So when she went to different colleges, she wasn't taking a train. She might have been taking a train, but she was, taking, she was riding a horse somewhere. And she was riding a horse to some place where there weren't a whole lot of women in the medical field. And she, had, she was a medical doctor, so she's an amazing human in that respect. She was the first female state senator in the United States, and she ran against her husband. She beat her husband to become the first female state senator in the United States. So, I mean, insanely dynamic, powerful woman. Um, a huge proponent of polygamy. And such a proponent of polygamy that rather than allow her husband to be arrested for polygamy, she went to Europe and hid out in Europe so that they couldn't prosecute him for being a polygamist. So there's this interesting thing because I think for many of us, non-Mormons, there would be this thought that, oh, women are oppressed by polygamy and if they were given the keys to unlock that oppression, they would flee from it. Well, that's what, um, that's what suffragettes thought. And so Utah was one of the first territories to gain the women's right to vote before it was nationally allowed. So you've got this whole country where women can't vote and you got Utah, which believes in polygamy, where they gave women the right to vote. That happens because the suffragettes thought if we give women the right to vote, that'll end polygamy. So ending polygamy was a bigger deal to Americans at that point than women's right to vote. Like, they didn't want women to vote, but what they wanted even less was polygamy. So we're gonna give women the right to vote so they'll end polygamy. We'll take our, our medicine, which is giving women the right to vote, as long as we get the thing we want, which is the end of polygamy. So they do it, and the women are like, well, we don't really mind polygamy, we're Mormons. I don't know if you read, but we decided to be Mormons and we're okay with polygamy. And they're like, oh, well that didn't work. So they took it away again. So they took away women's right to vote before it goes national. And then several years later, it becomes national. So there's this roller coaster of women's rights that goes on in Utah. And I think that there's this ability for people to, outsiders to look at that and say, oh, those dumb Mormons or we, however you want to categorize the other and say that there's something wrong with them. Here's this insanely smart, insanely talented, dynamic woman who believed in polygamy. So how do you hold both of these things? And powerful state senator in, a time, in the 1800s, like impossible stuff that this woman does, and she believes in polygamy. So to me, she's a great representation of this, you know, what are our preconceptions? That's the mirror part. I look at it and I bring my preconceptions of what I think someone would be dealing with. And it's like, no, that's not it at all. She's got this whole thing going on that I, I, how can I start to accept that? How can I accept America? How can I accept the humanity involved in them? There's a distance, it's a big distance. So it's really easy for her to be this <coughs> narrative that I can take in and accept <coughs> that complexity in. But you get a little closer to home and that uncomfortableness, right? I was saying that uncomfortableness is really kind of the key to this. And I think 
we use a lot of mechanisms to avoid uncomfortableness in our culture. And I think that's one of the things that drove me to do this show is to find the things that make me really uncomfortable and find the things that I can't um, put away easily and to try and express those and think that if I can express those that maybe other people uh, could engage in some of that uncomfortableness. So I think of things like, my wife's from Georgia and so we go back to Georgia a lot and they're really into college football in Georgia. Like they're really into college football in Georgia. And I kept, I kept thinking like, there's something going on with this that I don't really understand. And I, it's uncomfortableness. If you're having a conversation with somebody and you're afraid that something uncomfortable might come up, you wanna veer away to talk about the weather. And college football is the weather. You can have two people who believe in different teams, but you still know we're talking about football and that we're never gonna stumble into gay rights. We're never gonna stumble into abortion. We're never gonna stumble into anything that might make us uncomfortable. We're gonna talk about college football. This is why when Colin Kaepernick takes a knee at a football game, that it's so upsetting because football is supposed to be this place where nothing uncomfortable happens. We specifically have designed this to avoid talking about this other stuff. So this is this powder keg that goes on. It's like, why, why should it be a big deal? It's a big deal because these are things that we do to avoid uncomfortableness. And so a lot of things in our culture are built to avoid that uncomfortableness, to create this simplicity, to make it so that we just can think about heroes and villains. So this, uh, the, the big guy on the end here, his name's uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's, he's one of the real hard ones for me. Um, so that makes him my favorite, one of my favorites, because he's so hard, because he so, he's, makes me so uncomfortable. He's so challenging. Um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, Forrest Gump, is named for Nathan Bedford Forrest. In the movie, he specific, Forrest Gump says he's named for Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, Nathan Bedford Forrest was really rich, really smart, made his money uh, buying African human beings and selling them to people. Ugh. So we could end there, you know, and you're like, okay, I already know who this guy is. Or we can go a step further and say he was a Confederate general. Okay. You know, and it's easy to categorize them, and you're done with them. Um, he was really, really smart. He was so smart that um, Ulysses S. Grant, generals from the North, said that he was the smartest man to come out of the war. And he, this was their opponents. His opponents said this about him. He uh, rose from being a private to being a general. It's very few people have ever done that. Um, he... Uh, he was the first, he was called the Wizard of the Saddle because of the way he used his troops. That he used mounted infantry and people weren't doing that and anyway. So, but they called him the Wizard of the Saddle because he was really great with horses. And he becomes the first leader of the KKK. Not only that, the title of the leader of the KKK is the Grand Wizard of the KKK, which is a weird title unless you know that Nathan Bedford Forrest was the first leader and he was called the Wizard of the Saddle. So it's like, oh, the term Grand Wizard of the KKK comes from this guy. Like, I don't know how to sugarcoat it anymore. <laughs> we, we can take that and we can go start tearing down statues to him because there are a lot of statues to him because he was this very successful businessman. He was one of the smartest men in the war. He's this, you know, this icon of Southern intelligence and economic strength. Um, but then you start digging in a little deeper. When he was the first leader of the KKK, that means that he released the first edict of the KKK. The first written edict of the KKK was, we must disband this organization, we must burn these robes, and we must end this because he, he didn't like the violence against the newly freed blacks. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, so he, he not only leaves the KKK, he tells them that they have to knock it off. And he was one of the most well-respected people after the war. And he says, you guys are screwing this up. 
he goes to um, the governor of Tennessee and he says, I offer my services as a leader, as a military leader, we must show violence towards these whites who are lynching these blacks because violence is the only thing they will understand. Okay. So he also gives a couple of speeches and one of them is to an organization called the, the Pole Bearers Association, which is uh, blacks during reconstruction. And he just goes on to say, you know, we got to figure out a way to live harmoniously, you know, blah, 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 blah. So some people can take that to be that he's trying to cover up for all this stuff he did. And sure, you could say that, but if he was trying to cover it up, I don't think he would go straight out after the KKK and tell him to knock it off. I, he made a lot of enemies doing that. He made even more enemies when he said this thing to the governor of Tennessee. But looking at one particular thing he did, and it was the speech he gave to his troops at the end of the Civil War. So he's this super famous general at the end of the Civil War, and he's got all of his troops there, and the war's over, and he says, you know, there's a lot of, and you know, it's the Civil War, so they're so much better spoken than us. Right? Just like the speeches are just, oh my God. Like if we had, you know, but anyway. Um, in his speech, he says, there's a lot of animosity that came out of this war. There's a lot of animosity for people who were close to us. And the war's over, and we have to get over that animosity, and we need to find a way to love each other, and we need to find a way to move forward, because that animosity is not going to be productive. We need to, we need to bury the hatchet. We need to say, the war's over. We're going to make the, the best of this. And you can read the speech, and the speech is really beautiful, and the speech really, if you were to then recontextualize it for the most recent election, it's like he's, he's speaking to something that's really important. So we can throw him out and we can knock down all his statues and everything like that, but it doesn't get to the heart of what's really separating us because he is a hero to some people. The same way that gunpowder flag represents something to these gun shop owners. He is a hero to them, and it's if to understand, well, yeah, he was a great businessman, but his business was selling human beings. Well, yeah, but it was legal. It's like, yeah. So, so then I start to try and think of things that, well, what do I accept? What are things that I accept that, um, Stokey Carmichael, it's this great example. So Stokey Carmichael's down around the corner. Stokey Carmichael was, um, he started as a nonviolent activist. And he preached nonviolence and he worked with Martin Luther King and that was all great. And then one summer he went down to Mississippi and he organized all these black voters and he got this huge block of black voters and he took them up to the Democratic National Convention. He said, I have all of these black voters. I have a huge voting block. I want them seated at the Democratic National Convention. Democratic National Convention said, no, we're gonna seat the white Jim Crow delegation instead. And he said, ah, this doesn't work. This is not going to work. And he became the Prime Minister of the Black Panthers. So the Black Panthers, I can't condone everything they ever did. They did some great stuff. They did some stuff that might be questionable, but there's that complexity again. So Stokey Carmichael's this great representation that he started with nonviolence, found that nonviolence wasn't working for him, and then changed over to political action, black separatists. So it's, it's owning this, this complexity, and it's also owning the preconceptions that we bring to these individuals and that we bring to America in general. I think I can also talk a little bit about, um, that's kind of conceptually, I think that gives you a good idea of the direction of the show and what, what's trying to happen there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, the process of making the mirrors. Um, so I start with these sheets of glass and then uh, you have to cleanse them really well. And then there's a, a tinning agent that goes on them that lets silver stick to it. And then I spray this silver on and then uh, apply uh, these contaminants to it to distress the silver and then print uh, the portraits on that. So what you're looking at here is there's a sheet of glass, there's a layer of silver, and then the portrait is on that. So um, they're really delicate. Because normally if you've got a mirror, you've got the sheet of glass and then the silver's on the back of the glass. So when you touch it, you're touching glass and the silver's through it. Uh, this is the opposite. So this is, you're actually looking at the back of um, a traditional mirror um, in this case. 
So the silver's on the front? The silver's on the front. And the portrait's pretty on top. And the portrait's on the, so it's, yeah. So the glass is at the back, and then the silver, and then the portrait's on top of that. So your printing company has to be particularly careful. Everything has to be particularly careful. Um, you have to be careful about, um, you know, obviously you have to only touch them with rubber gloves um, once you start the process because any of the oils from your finger will um, damage the ability of the silver to hang onto the glass. Um, yeah, there's, it's, it's amazing what just um, supporting the glass, if it's not completely supported, if there's a part that's supported differently, then the silver will pool in those places and then you'll get these crazy inconsistencies of uh, of the silver adhering and of the contaminants mm. and everything like that. That's how you get that streaking. And so you have to be very careful about not doing that too quickly. Just stuff. Why didn't you do it the other way? Well, so um, what ends up happening is um, I did tests of, um, well, for one thing, you've got the glass and you've got the silver you would have to put the portrait on this side of the glass because if you put it here, you're just looking at the silver and you don't see anything. So when you do that though, now you've got this eighth or sixteenth of an inch that the portrait is yeah, away from the mirror. And so now you see a double image of it because you see the ink and then you can see it reflected in the mirror. Also, it's interesting that you won't often see um, this texture because Again, this is the back. The fronts of these don't look like this. The fronts of these are much closer to pure mirror finish, you know, with some distressing going on in them. But they, you don't get this uh, this level of complexity in the um, in the image on the other side of them. Any other questions? Any questions about anybody in the show? Did any, are there anybody in the show that you already knew about? Did anybody already know anybody in the show? Yeah, who'd you know about? Margaret Sanger. Okay, what'd you know about Margaret Sanger? Uh, quite a bit. I used to work with Gunter Head. Sure. <laughs> so, and did, did you know about you know about you know her stance on abortion? Yes. So fascinating concept, right? This is just to even say this sentence: Margaret Sanger was against abortion. So you say that sentence, and you're like, oh, she's like a pro-lifer. It's like, well, she was against abortion because she didn't think anybody should ever have one because she thought birth control should be so good that nobody would ever have to go through such a terrible thing. So there's a sentence you can totally take and spin any way you want. If, you're, if you want to be pro-life, you want to say, oh, well, Margaret Sanger was pro-life. She's like, she wasn't about like, oh, you're pregnant and you want an abortion, you shouldn't have one. She's like, you shouldn't have gotten pregnant in the first place and we should all have the tools to prevent that from ever happening. So, you know, there's a complexity with that. She also had some very interesting things that she said about eugenics, which is, oh, poor people shouldn't be reproducing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, it's an interesting way to say it, you know, and she was very, um, she was very a big proponent of that. Now, what I think is interesting is, there's another gentleman in the show named Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush, for me, had a lot of baggage coming in. I would say from the beginning, he was somebody who I had to really uh, fight with to even uh, deal with putting him in the show because he's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that he participated in that um, I think would be really challenging. Um, you know, not the least of which producing the entire Bush family. But um, he, uh, he was also, he's one of the founders of Planned Parenthood. You know, Margaret Sanger uh, st didn't start Planned Parenthood. She started like the precursors to it. But when it actually turned into Planned Parenthood, Prescott Bush was there as one of the proponents of it. And I mentioned that to somebody at the show and they said, oh, well, it's probably because of the eugenics stuff. And I was like, well, that's interesting, interesting premise. And I'll grant you that. But if we go there with that, how does that not then say that instead of it being a slight against Prescott Bush, how do we make it not a slight against Planned Parenthood? Because if you can then imagine that Planned Parenthood was seen by Prescott Bush as a tool of eugenics, why do you not see it that way? Maybe it is, or something along those lines. But so it's a really interesting, you know, because he was also um, treasurer for the United Negro College Fund and things like that. And it's like, oh, well, if you bring this preconception that he's an evil human being to it, then you can then make up all these narratives about how, oh, well, he had bad intentions with the United Negro College Fund and Planned Parenthood. It's like, or he was a complex human 
and did some things you like and some things you don't like. But yeah, I thought she was a really good one because she's another one that's real easy to say, oh, she's the greatest. And oh, wow, it really makes me uncomfortable with the stuff she did. Anybody else? Did anybody know this guy, William Kunstler? My dad did. So William Kunstler was a, um, he was a defense attorney, but his, his thing, he was a big civil rights attorney. And so what he was well known for was defending people who you might not uh, think should have been defended. Um, it, it, his first big case was a group called the Chicago Seven. And the Chicago Seven were um, protesting against uh, the Vietnam War. Well, what Kunstler discovered was, and this is something that, once you see what he was doing, you can see that the OJ trial, you know, comes specifically from this. Like a lot of our modern contemporary uses of the media and things of that nature to, um, to work with trials come from some of the things that he pioneered. But his concept was these kids were being um, tried for protesting the Vietnam War and they were being tried, you know, was their protest legal or not? And he said, you know what, that's not what's on trial here. What's on trial here is, is the war legal or not? And nobody knew how to really kind of deal with that. So he turned it into this, this, this theater. It was, it was theater inside. So when they would give somebody a chance to talk, normally you would expect them to defend themselves or blame somebody else or something like that. He might bring a famous singer in to sing God Bless America, put them on the stand and sing God Bless America. He might bring in, he, he was famous for bringing in famous actors like Harry Belafonte to sit behind the defendants so that the photographers would get images of the defendants with Harry Belafonte sitting next to them. <laughs> like these, just these, these manipulations, but his whole concept was that it wasn't these kids that were on trial. It was if the war is unjust, then what is our ability to express that we disagree with it? And if these kids are locked up for it, does that mean that we do not have the right to speak this? So that, in that case, that's what he was doing there, but that kind of opened his eyes up to this notion of what are these preconceptions we bring and how can we start unpacking that? Of course, that led to things like um, the guy who bombed the World Trade Center. And you're like, well, how can you defend that? And it's like, well, are we, what is our policy in the Middle East? Would be something he might say about that. He's like, how can we try American Middle East policy. And so he would turn the trial into American Middle East policy. Like, shouldn't we not be over there creating these people who want to come and bomb us instead of trying this guy? So there, talk about uncomfortable. Well, they're, he's defending him and he got a lot of flack for that. But it's funny because then in him, I see a little bit of this show that, you know, defending somebody like Nathan Bedford Forrest you know, and saying, yeah, he might have done some good stuff. He was the first head of the Klan. What are you talking about? Yeah, I know. But he might have done some good stuff, too. Well, and that's, for me, one of the most interesting parts about this show. It's very easy to get involved on this on an individual level because you chose individuals that were so compelling and so fascinating. It's very interesting to get involved in their lives. But for me, when you stand back and look at the show as a whole, it also it is a reflection of our society. Like, for instance, I would guess that everybody in this room has heard of Susan B. Anthony. Mm -hmm. For what? Bringing women's suffrage to right. Why has nobody in this room heard of her? Right. Well, and <laughs> interestingly enough, Susan B. Anthony is one of the people who got women's right to vote. It, it's, it's fascinating if you just look up suffrage in Utah, because Susan B. Anthony goes to Utah to get women the right to vote there on the basis of eliminating polygamy in Utah and then finds out and she she spoke to these Mormon groups and would come right out and say it right she'd go there and she'd be like yeah women power we're gonna get rid of polygamy and they go uh can you leave we tried this <laughs> they'll be like you we want you out don't come here speaking your crap like so she thinks oh all women everywhere are anti-polygamists and it's like no Mormon women are actually pro-polygamy. They're into it. They were raised with it. They can see benefits of it. Things that we see as total negatives, they see other things that are positive. They're willing to overlook the negatives in order to get the positives, and we're, over, we're willing to overlook the positives in order to point out the negatives. Right. And that's, I mean, it's such a great example of, you know, Susan B. Anthony, you know, great stuff, totally blind to the needs of Mormon women. 
Couldn't even see it. Like, just refused. And they, yeah, they didn't, they said, you don't have to come back. <laughs> but she was, she was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. The conversations I've been having recently, like, check out this, um, you know, are, are in the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. movement, you know, are people like Roman Blansky, do, can we still appreciate his art? But right, you know, right. I, I do feel slightly uncomfortable with the argument that no, we absolutely cannot ever recognize any of the the, the things that any of these people have done. Uh, you know, and I am I'm still on the fence about that. I still don't it's really tough. know where to place it. It's really I hard. feel like being on one complete side or the other is not the right place to be. Well, I think uh, just to address, I think there's something really important about um, talking about Me Too and mm -hmm. um, misogyny in general. I specifically <laughs> chose. There, there's no one in here who uh, is known for misogyny. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that was a really, first of all, too easy. Because I feel like, it's pro I mean, Nathan Bedford Forrest, probably, probably a misogynist, I don't know. Like, not documented. But, you know, just, it seemed like something that was too easy to categorize someone. That it's like, okay, I need some stuff that's more complex. Mm -hmm. And that what's also interesting is, since it's something that's right now, something that we're like facing right now and we're really dealing with right now, um, what I was saying before about her being dead right. and these people all being dead, it's so much easier to take their narratives and decide that I can be okay with their complexity. Right. The last four, you know, Bernie and Hillary and yeah. Donald and Obama, right? So my test for myself, my final exam is, can I take this and then apply it to those four, <laughs> right? Because, you know, I mean, I know where I stand on those things, but it's like, okay, let's, let's start with Obama, because love Obama. Did he do some things that I didn't appreciate? Yes, okay, so he's a complex human. I can start to see that there are flaws in him. It's like, okay, now can I start drawing that through all of them? I mean, if I can put a picture of Nathan Bedford Forrest up there and stand next to it and get my picture taken with it, I mean, people are tearing down his statues today. There's a statue of him getting torn down somewhere. Like, they, they despise, but it's also because they should really put a statue next to him of like a slave trading post. You know, like, let's not forget who he is. He did some good stuff. He did some bad stuff. Let's talk about the real conversation, which is we need to come to terms with our complexity with slavery, with our complexity with Native Americans. We need to come to terms with those complexities. But if I can stand next to a picture of Nathan Bedford Forrest, and I still have trouble standing next to a picture of Donald Trump, like, S same guy, yeah. same guy, <laughs> like s same, but just like, you know, but he's dead. Right. And it's like, oh, man, and he can't do anything. Yeah. This other guy, it's like, oh, uh, you know, how can I, how can I remove myself from that, you know, that emotional reaction, you know, the, the present time. The maintaining the current power structure is totally maintained by us not getting together by us being further and further apart. And so they exacerbate that. Yeah. So if we can find commonality, we'll find that that commonality is, you know, the, the things that they don't like are things that we don't like, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it goes, you know, totally that Margaret Sanger thing of like, oh, anti-abortion, great. Can we all be anti-abortion? Mm -hmm. Meaning that we all think that birth control should be everywhere and we should have the ability to never, like that we shouldn't just have abortions because yeah, that would be great. And then occasionally you have a few for some really bad things that have happened, but let's try to eliminate most of them. Like I think that's a, an easy one that like everyone could agree on, but it's like, no, no, no. They're gonna figure out a way to make that language something that makes everybody inflamed on both sides of the issue. And I think, you know, that, that's, that's the concept. The, it's amazing how much of our lives are controlled by what a couple of Austrians did at the beginning of last century. Sigmund Freud came up with this concept of the unconscious and the subconscious and worked to find a way to soothe them so that these, these things that come up for us are, are, are let out and they don't become these explosive issues. And Hitler figured out a way to take that and turn it into how can we inflame that and make people really pissed off at each other so we can harness that. And then Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, says how can we take that and start selling products to people by bypassing their rational mind and going to their subconscious. And he invents public relations and he invents modern advertising. And so we're at the, we're, we're totally 
puppets to this stuff that a couple of Austrians came up with at the beginning. It's like unbelievable that these little ideas about the subconscious could grow into these inflamed, violent ideas that that subvert our rational minds. And and here we are. And we're th that's they're using that to drive us further and further apart. They do focus groups on what's gonna drive you nuts? What if I say this sentence? Does it drive you nuts if I say that they're pulling puppy dog teeth to make iPhones? Does that drive you nuts? Okay, <laughs> that's what we're gonna say then. They use puppy dog teeth in iPhones. Like that's the thing that makes you the most pissed? There you go, that's what we're gonna use. And like just right past the rational mind, you go, wait a sec, how do they use puppy dog teeth in iPhones? I don't know, but God, knock it off. The um. The guy who killed the lion, the dentist who killed the lion, right? How can I sit up here and say, the dentist who killed the lion, that lion was marked to be eliminated by the park rangers because the lion had gone rogue. The park rangers had to go out and kill that lion. That's their job. The park rangers are gonna go kill this lion because he's gone rogue. We've determined this lion can no longer exist. He's gonna damage the rest of the herd. So we have to go kill him. So what do they do when that instance comes up? They raffle off, they auction off the right for somebody to come in and kill it because they're gonna make all this money on a lion that has to be killed anyway so that they can then preserve all of these other animals. And I go, I don't wanna hear this. I want the dentist who killed the lion to be an asshole. I don't have time for this greater level of complexity. But the real, but, but the reality is, had he not done it, we would have had to pay for, that group would have had to pay for one of their rangers to go out and do this and kill this lion. Not only wouldn't they have made any money on it, they would have paid money for this person to go do it. The money they made on that goes to then support this whole process even greater. And it's like, I'm not saying which is better or worse, but man, that's complicated. The reality is that trophy hunting has saved dozens of animals from the extinction list. It's crazy, it's crazy. It's, it's so hard to, to take this image that comes up on your Facebook feed of this guy with a lion tail or something or with a dead lion and say, he's doing good work. <laughs> Keep it up, buddy. You're my guy. It's, it's, really, it's really hard and you know, I, I could do one of him. I could be, he's still alive. I try and not do people who are alive, but I could do one of him. <laughs>